your city council public comment meeting. Before Mayor Pro Tim Bivens calls the meeting to order, we ask that you please silence all electronic devices. For those of you who have requested to speak, there are two podiums in the chamber. The podium in the back is for individuals with mobility concerns. We ask all others to step forward to the front podium. Each podium has a countdown clock located to the speaker's right that will indicate how much time is remaining. When you have 30 seconds left, a bell will sound. When your time has ended, the bell will sound again. Before you begin your comments, please state your name. Thank you. And with that, we are calling tonight's meeting to order. A quorum is established. Reverend Dr. Steve Jeffrey of the All Saints Presbyterian Church will give the invocation. Please stand and remain standing for the pledges. Let's pray. Almighty Father, you have given all authority in heaven and on earth to Jesus Christ, who has delegated a portion of that authority to civil rulers like those standing here, who have the important and difficult job of administering his will in his name to discern those things which are evil which need to be stopped and those things which are good which need to be done. And so we pray you'd assist them, that you would act through their actions to frustrate the desires of those who do evil and to bring about that which would be good for this city. We're conscious, Father, that we are at times frustrated not just by evil, but by our own ignorance and foolishness. We come up with all manner of well-meaning ideas which are misguided, and we ask, therefore, for a measure of spirit-filled humility for all those here present, that they would be able to listen to one another so as to come up with proposals and policies and actions which not only mean well, but do good. And so guard and guide and protect them. We thank you for them. And we ask that for decades to come, the citizens of this city and their children's children would have cause to thank you for them, for the wisdom and justice which you work in and through them this evening. And we pray in the name of the King, our Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you. First item on the agenda calls for the consideration of minutes from the March 5th work session, the March 5th public comment, and the March 19th council meetings. Move for approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Please vote. Motion is approved. We are now entering the public comment period to reiterate the rules for you. You have three minutes to speak. You will hear a bell. That means you have 30 seconds remaining. You'll hear another bell. That means your time is up and the microphone will be silenced. With that, Jeanette, please call the speakers. Our first speaker will be Bob Willoughby. Go ahead and play the video. Let's check the sound. Test, test, testing the sound. Turn the sound up. So right now, you're saying we've got three houses. By the end of the day, we'll have four houses. I want what okay. I got drawn on the map. That shows one in the okay. street to the other, okay? Can we get that? 
Sure. Okay, we'll get that. Okay. Because you're, I want to know. I want you to know. I'm going to have her call you personally, Renee, so you'll know the fourth one zone, okay? And I believe it's Brandy's one they said. The map is drawn out, the disputed area. It doesn't say it to reach the end of the street or what? Disputed area. And that's what I draw it out there. It's disputed. The houses in that disputed area, we have four. Through it. There's seven. We have four of them. That should make the map, and we should be able to stamp that, okay? Okay. Well, you, did, you did your due diligence, and you collected the signatures. The rules are 50% plus one for the petition to pass. What this means Matty Parker. When a neighborhood association draws a map, with 20 homes inside the map, the neighborhood association would need 11 homes to sign the petition for the petition to pass. That is what 50% plus 1 means. And that is what the Drawn Heights Neighborhood Association did. Why is the Drawn Heights Neighborhood Association map not on the city database? Mr. Cook, you got time to comment on why you had an answer about our meeting? Do you have time to comment, Mr. Cook, on why you hadn't responded about our meeting, sir? You know we had a meeting, and I gave you all the evidence and everything, but you hadn't responded. Are you ignoring me now, sir? That's okay. Okay, that's the city manager, Mr. Cook. He's turned his back on this question. We had a one-hour meeting, gave him everything, and he has not responded. No response, zero. You know? Short. I guess in short, we could say we need to go to the city manager then, right? One of those in that area. Back to the mayor, actually. It's in short, right? Because you don't directly... It doesn't go back to the mayor in well, a city manager form of government. Well, it goes to the mayor because the mayor instructs the manager what to do. The manager won't do his job unless the mayor tells him to. Okay. okay. See, we, we meet the rules for this map to be drawn for the John T. White, I mean, for the Drawn Heights Neighbor Association. But Michelle Gook, the director, is not doing her job. And uh, I got this letter from the lawyer saying, not to talk to Michelle, don't question her. So what happens when I come down here today, they wouldn't play all this video, part of it's cut out. The part was telling the mayor that the city employee is not doing her job to tell the manager to make her do her job. Now, Michelle Goose, not responsible. The mayor is not wanting Michelle Goose to do her job. Thank you. Not enough time. Thank you, Mr. Willoughby. Call the next speaker. Our next speaker will be a remote speaker, and that will be Vera Lockett. And she's a call. Correct. Ms. Lockett? Hello. Yes, this is Vera Lockett speaking. And Go my ahead. address is one. 12121 Wilson Street, Crowley, Texas, 76036. Your time is running. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. I come to you um, today to bring attention to a grief injustice that has occurred within our community. I have to shed light on the corrupt practices of Saving Hope Rescue an organization that has not only stolen my beloved dogs, but has also subject me to ongoing harassment and false ac accusations. Uh, my husband is retired military, and they have also done this to a retired military veteran that was homeless. And for 78 days, I endured the anguish of not knowing the whereabouts of my furry companions and the director, Lauren Anton, knew they, that my dogs had an owner and I was looking for them and she kept them. And I received a text from the director, Lauren Anton, threatening to have the police called on me if I were to show up to any of her properties during this time. Saving Hope Rescue not only refused to return my dogs, but also went as far as threatening me with legal action. Unfortunately, they took one of my dogs and gave her to a uh, shelter in Washington. Um, she was transported to Washington and was adopted to another family. And only after I had to get an attorney did Lauren and Tom make arrangements for me to get my other dog back. 
And after I got the other dog back, then her staff accused me of bribery and extortion because they had because they were made to give the dog back. And Lauren Anton has um, done this to many people. So I do hope that um, something can or will be done to stop uh, Saving Hope Rescue from doing this to any other family or anybody else. And, and uh, I thank you for your time and listening to me in this matter. Thank you. Call the next speaker. Next speaker is Daniel Hayes. Good evening, my name is Dan Hayes and I live in District 11. Tonight I wanted to talk about Gateway Park. Gateway Park is Fort Worth's Central Park. By that I mean Gateway is the most centrally located park in the city and like New York's Central Park, it's roughly 800 acres in size. But there the comparisons end. Gateway is viewed by many as an east side park or one of nearly 300 parks the city is responsible for, but certainly not in the same way as New York Central Park uh, is viewed by New Yorkers. That's been reflected in the funding decisions made regarding Gateway Park over the years. Perhaps the best evidence is that at almost 50 years old, only half of the park is open to the public. Over the years, there's been a lot of aspirational talk about Gateway Park becoming a great park, sometimes comparing it to Central Park. But the talk always falls short of the reality. The master plan you will vote on in May is the sixth master plan for this park. The plans call for $140 million in improvements, which is more than twice what has been spent on the park since it was created. How are we going to get there? A growing group of us believe there needs to be a paradigm shift in how this park is viewed, funded, and programmed. This park isn't just big, it's really big. It's larger than 30 state parks, and sorted by size, 176 of Fort Worth's parks would fit inside Gateway Park. There's no reason it should not be thought of as one of the top draws in the city, as New York Central Park is. There's no reason that after the stockyards, the zoo, the Botanic Gardens, Sundance Square, and the Cultural District, that this park shouldn't be found on a list of most visited attractions in the city. That might sound laughable, but there were 600,000 visits to Gateway Park in 2023, according to the Park and Rec folks. It wasn't that many years ago that a number like that would equal the annual attendance for the zoo or the stockyards. And get this, that's the same number of visits the Botanic Gardens saw last year. I know that the city is capable of big things and we always find money for the things that are important. I hope as plans are made for the 2026 bond election, that Gateway can figure prominently in that uh, effort. I hope the city will work on finding ways to market the park better to the public. I hope we can find someone who can properly develop the frontage along Brain, uh, Beach Street and we would love to brainstorm these ideas with you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. Call the next speaker. Next speaker is Angela Blockowitz. Hi, my name is Angie Blockowitz, and I'm the president of the JMSL, or Jennings May St. Louis Neighborhood Association, located off the Hemphill Corridor. Over spring break, a multi-tent homeless camp set up in our neighborhood park, a park that we have been actively working to revitalize for our new place structure that arrives this year as part of the city's park project. We reported on My Fort Worth app, and on March 13th, we put out a request through social media for neighbors to report and to email a request for assistance from co-compliance and our District 11 Councilwoman Jeanette Martinez. That same day, her team reached out via email, and the next day, Councilwoman Martinez called us to let us know she had requested priority attention be given to this situation. Within three business days, the camp had been offered resources by the city and left the park, allowing the space to be usable again by the neighborhood. We want to give our sincere appreciation and thanks to Councilwoman Martinez for the timely manner in which this hand was handled, and we look forward to continuing working with you on the completion of our park project. Thanks. Thank you. Our next speaker will be George Childs.
My name is George Vernon Childs. I live in Fort Worth. I'm here to say that I cannot agree with the following public comment made on March 5th at 27 minutes, 20 seconds. Quote, we can come together, and as we come together, there's unity, there's strength and unity, unquote. By this, I certainly do not mean that these words have fallen on deaf ears by me, which I believe would imply rejection out of hand with no consideration of their meaning. To the contrary, my reaction is based on what I believe they mean to the speaker in the context of Fort Worth Municipal Affairs in light of previous statements by the speaker. These are, first, to city council, quote, it doesn't take any character to be negative, unquote, public comment, May 17, 2022, at 48 minutes, 40 seconds. My comment isn't saying something is wrong, the very epitome of negativity. So John Lewis and Rosa Parks had no character. Second, to city council in reference to, quote, those who complain, you're not obligated to listen to any of them, unquote. Public comment, March 7th, 2023, at 13 minutes, 20 seconds, to 13 minutes, 40 seconds. My comment is, uh, what's this about petition for redress of grievances clause of the First Amendment? Third, about city council, quote, you gain the right to be heard, unquote. Victory update, August 18th, 2020, at 21 minutes, 37 seconds. My comment is my right to be heard was gained on December 15th, 1791. Fourth, the reaction of some in this room to Ms. Jefferson being killed was described as, quote, every week 40 to 60 people would come, angry people, people full of hate and anger and retribution would come out and spew all of that on the city council. And this would take a couple of hours each week, unquote. YouTube changing your city, member training films, you view the full pay list, uh, and then select uh, number six, zero minutes and four seconds. My comment it is such more it is such, so it is so much more convenient to apply terms that are clearly value loaded in describing impassioned expressions of concern than to consider why that concern came to be. Fifth, the speakers characterized police going on duty as quote entering the battlefield unquote. Again, victory update, August eighteenth, twenty twenty. This time at thirty twenty seven minutes. Oh, four seconds. My comment is, I do not believe that the neighborhoods of Fort Worth are the place to seek action and adventure. In conclusion, I am convinced that the foregoing, the, the, the foregone gives ample warning as to what form the strength the speaker promises would take and what and who that strength would be directed against. Next speaker will be another remote speaker, David Martinez. Mr. Martinez? Hello? Hello? Yes, go ahead. Hello? You have three minutes. Okay. Uh, yes. Um, I do apologize for not being present there. I, I'm sorry for the sick. So, anyways, um, uh, when I went out of town and I ran into a guy who used to be a HOA president, um, and I learned a lot of stuff from him. I uh, was dealing with the uh, homeless, uh, with the panhandlers on the corner uh, on I, uh, I-35 and seminary. Um, one of the things that they did was they borrowed a technique that was used in El Paso um, was by um, putting stones in the median area uh, where we already have it. We're supposed to be uh, no panhandling there. Uh, and so um, I think that we could go move forward uh, right there on, on the corner of Seminary 935 and put stones there. Uh, that, that would work out um, if, uh, if I need to get it done myself. I, if the city allows me to do it, I could do it myself. Uh, anyways, uh, also, there are lots of ideas that I was uh, considering uh, and talking to them about, and uh, I'll talk about those later, but one of the things I want to bring up to attention is the state of Texas moving forward with rezoning the whole state where you're allowed to put up structures in your backyard and rent them out uh, according to how you feel to, uh, regardless of what we have zoned in our Fort Worth City and our neighborhoods in District 8, 9, 11. Uh, I'm very concerned with that. Also, my property over there in, in District 3, um, I think that would be uh, lower the property values of uh, my properties, and also it will also cause lots of problems. So I would like to, for the city to start uh, uh, looking at uh, dealing with that problem when it comes up, or actually before it comes up, actually. Uh, and thank you for your time. Thank you. God bless. Bye-bye. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jan Buck. And Ms. Buck, I believe you have a group that has given you your name. If they could, if they could stand, just so we could make sure you have your ten people. Thank you. 
That's more than 10. Yeah, we had more than we planned. We're serious. <laughs> Good evening, my name is Jan Buck and I live in District 11 and I'm here tonight because I am the current moderator for the Riverside Alliance. And so I'm speaking on behalf of the group and several other residents that have come tonight to just show support. Um, we do have some neighborhood presidents. Uh, Carlos Canisares is here from Bonnie Bray. Belinda Norris was going to be here, but apparently couldn't make it, had some kind of emergency. We have Phyllis Allen from United Riverside. Rick Herring, I know you're familiar with, with Carter Riverside. And then Katie Owen is actually the vice president from Oakhurst Neighborhood Association, standing in for Catherine Omar Kale. So we're here tonight to request that a new or significantly renovated Riverside uh, Community Center be included in the 2026 bond. We know we're very early in the process and are aware that there's actually already been some discussion about this issue. And fortunately, Council Person Martinez is supportive, but uh, we just wanted to let you all know that Riverside residents are very much in support as well. Many of the other older neighborhoods in Fort Worth have already received new community centers, and we think it's time for Riverside to get to move into the 21st century too. If you'll look at some of the pictures, oh, you've got them all up there. Okay, well, so that's the new one. So if we could move that top corner one off and let's see, maybe put in the tiny bathroom. So just to give you the, that front, the brick, that is our current community center. And to the left of that is our very inviting lobby. Um, then we have, that is a little two stall bathroom that supposedly serves the basketball crew. So that, and then our, there's the kitchen and our tiny workout room. But Riverside Community Center is one of the oldest in Fort Worth and was opened in 1955, and not much has changed. In the 1980s, the entrance was moved to face the parking lot. Apparently, it, faced, it was on the opposite side of the building, but they moved it around so people didn't have to walk quite so far. And the wooden floor was redone several years ago. However, the floor already has water damage, and the holes for the volleyball poles were improperly placed on one of the courts, so it's not even usable, the net that doesn't fit. And so um, the workout facilities are extremely small. In fact, I, they're not much bigger than my kitchen. And so there's really only about room for one person to work out. If you walk, I go there to work out and if somebody else is in there, you really, you feel like you're intruding in their personal space and, and it's just awkward. So nobody lasts very long in there if there's somebody else there and there's really no way that you can be in the area uh, for weights. Um, uh, we also, there are some outdoor tennis courts and sand volleyball courts that are very much in need of repair and a larger pro playground with a fence for security would likely attract many more families. Um, Riverside has an extremely popular boxing club that about 75 kids and adults participate in um, and they're confined to a fairly small space, although at times use the other half of the gym that cannot be used for volleyball. They do get some of that. We have several nights where volleyball is going on and plenty of people show up to use both courts, but obviously we're limited to just to one because of the flaw in the floor. Uh, Riverside Summer Camp used to be very popular. In fact, I was told it was one of the most attended, but uh, interest has decreased as other updated centers are able to offer more programs and more things for the kids. So, you know, we, with, I have no doubt that with more space for activities and some amenities that there would be a lot more going on at the center. There are a good number of community meetings held at the Riverside Community Center, and there is a need for some more meeting rooms as well as a larger one. Um, <clears throat> also, the AV equipment is very unreliable. Um, Councilwoman Martinez is nodding her head. I think even uh, City Manager Cook has been there, and as well as other speakers. And you know, trying to lead a meeting with the outdated and unpredictable AV equipment is just kind of a challenge. You really need to be ready with a plan B. Um, Riverside community has great staff with longtime employee Paula Connor leading the way. And from their perspective, I, like I, said, I do go there, I frequent that and we have talked with them. And of course they're communicating with the park and rec department, but we'll just add that they really wanna see a larger updated kitchen, expanded storage, improved computer lab, a labeled walking trail around the park, updated plumbing, as well as the items already mentioned. So just in closing, both staff and residents would like to see some kind of kid-friendly water feature. Riverside previously had a pool that was heavily used by residents but was closed when Fort Worth closed most of the city pools. The community center sits in the middle of a fabulous park with plenty of space for a larger facility, 
some kind of water feature, an expanded playground, and other amenities. We really believe the use of the community center and surrounding park would increase significantly with some improved facilities and increased security measures. So we really appreciate you considering that for the 2026 bond. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your proactive stance in budget preparation. Thank you very much. Please call the next speaker. Our next speaker will be Jim DeLong. Good evening, I'm Jim DeLong, and I'm here again with my red ball. And the first time I came here, I said, if I taught my youngest son colors, and I said, this is green, and I had a green ball, called it red, he could pass a lie detector test that this is a green ball. And this is indicative of the many ideologies that we have around the world today. Some call this purple, yellow, red, green, brown, black, many different colors. And the point I'm trying to make is uh, my son had a perception of reality when he called this green, even though it's red. But he would go to the mat that it's green. And we have that going around in our country and our world where people have ideologies and they will go to the mat for it because they believe it. And what's happened over the, over the years and it's really oh, throughout history, uh, you have factions saying this is one color and this is another color and because you don't believe that is the color I think it is, then I need to do something about you so that you would believe that the color I think it is it is. Maybe the color they think it is isn't even really the true color that it is because they have a perception of reality. And the point is, when you're in that situation, the gap between those ide ideologies is too wide. How do you come together on something like that? Well, and I'm solution-minded. I'm always thinking, how can we bring people together? Can we differ of opinion? Sure we can. But that doesn't mean we exclude people and want to, in some cases, uh, uh, have genocide against a certain people. What can we do? What can we find in common? And I've used this example many times. Uh, maybe you like ice cream and I like ice cream. That can seem like something extremely trivial, but what does it do? It connects us together. And if we can start on issues that might seem trivial, that connects us together, maybe we can start building coalitions instead of building walls and, and increase division. Because we're in a time in, our, in the world today where there is increased division, more than any time I've seen in my life. And that doesn't do anybody any major good. I think. Thank you, Jim. Please call the next speaker. Our next speaker is Randolph Shahid. Good evening, Mayor, City Council. I don't know who the mayor is, and the reason why I don't vote, the reason why I can't vote. I'm an ex-offender, still on parole, being on parole for 41 calendar years, and want to vote so that I'll have representation, but right now, no taxation without representation is just something that I learned in elementary school. And being an ex-offender and wanting to make a difference by doing what ex-offenders don't normally do, and that is go against crime, get your community cleaned up, have people put 
hits out on you because you're getting rid of drugs in your own community with no help, just trying to be a good ex-offender. I live in Fort Worth, Texas, and I know that it's, it's good white people here in Fort Worth, Texas. I'm looking for white folks that care about Fort Worth, Texas, and that can look and see what an ex-offender is doing in his lives that he's saving in Fort Worth, Texas, and help me along with... What is the name of it? Jules. I'm a person that want to risk my life to save lives and to prove that it works by being and doing what I've been doing. All I want to do is make sure that white folks help me because the black church, the black community, they won't help me. They'll run away from me. They won't let me speak. They don't ask questions about what is it that you can do to teach somebody how not to go to prison. That's why I'm so involved now with an organization that's it's, a, it's woman led. And it's about making sure that the changes that are supposed to occur in the community can occur in the community by coming together and be under one principle. And that principle is truth. That principle is God. And what we want to do is get white people to help a black person to help the black community by helping the whole community to be more successful. Thank you so much. Please call the next speaker. Thank you so much. The next speaker is J.D. Jimerson. Uh, good afternoon or good evening. My name is J.D. Jimerson, and I'm going to speak to everyone on the, on the council. And this is about maybe the fifth or sixth time I've addressed the same issue. Um, and I can appreciate some of the preceding people. But my concern is this. We've got uh, ordinance, ordinance number 201-91-05-2012. That governs loud noises and dis, dis, dis recklessness in the neighborhoods and throughout the city. That's been going on for three years, and I've been before the city council on more than three times. I want to ask that you all will look at that ordinance and see what it says. It says, if it disturbs anybody, any person, um, there's been misinformation provided throughout the neighborhood. If a police officer comes to a house and says they have an ordinance, so that makes it legal, most of my neighbors are afraid to say anything. But that's not me. I don't know any better. I'm, I want to apologize for myself. Because I'm going to say something that may not change anything, but I'm going to make it a matter of fact. We need some changes because I'm tired of staying up to 3 o'clock and 4 o'clock on Fridays and Saturday nights or any night preceding a holiday because of loud music coming from 1616 Northwest 35th, which is a rodeo arena. I read the guidelines. I'm neighborhood president and on different boards for the city. So don't tell me what it is and don't think I can't verify it. I can read a little bit. So I read the ordinance. I'm going to ask you all to look at it. And whoever needs to address the situation, please address that because I don't feel good about it. My neighbors are afraid to say anything because they say, well, if the policeman says it's, 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 a, uh, it's a permit that's been provided, then it's legal. Permits give you authorization to do different things. But the guidelines and procedures and rules along with any permit that you receive that tells you how that's supposed to be conducted. Things are not being conducted as they should. Um, I've talked to several officers. Two or three have come to my house after, after making complaints at 2 o'clock in the morning or after 12, and, and will tell me, well, we don't know what time the, the, the permit expires. The, the, I mean, tell me something else. I know better. But let me yield. I, I hope that you all got my point because I could stay here for another 15 minutes, but I won't. 
please look into that ordinance and then effect a way to resolve the issue where they can't have rodeo music going. Mr. Jimison, I want you to get to know Valerie Washington. Val, raise your hand. Ms. Washington and Mr. William Johnson, who is not here this evening, are the two assistant city managers who are dealing with that issue. Please get her card. We talked about it today, and work is underway. Thank oh, you so much. Okay, and I was advised that today that that had happened. Thank you. Uh -huh. Call the next speaker. Our next speaker is Adrian Smith. How about James Smith? Good afternoon, Council. My name is James Smith. I live in District 8. Four years, five months, and 21 days ago, my neighbor was killed. And the accountability hasn't been fulfilled. I hear you guys say, you're done, to several speakers when they stand at this podium. You're done. Well, City of Fort Worth, you're not done. Last year, the tourism took in $3.1 billion. Great city. It was a historic event. Aaron Dean's arrest and conviction was a historic event. Zion's settlement was a historic event. I want to get my life back, and I can't get my life back until you're done. Everybody has probably gone about their merry way, but I have not gone about my merry way because I haven't, because you haven't finished. I'd appreciate it if you finish it. I know the, lega the legalities take time, but four years, in five months, in 21 days? Breonna Taylor's family was settled and they didn't even have a trial. Nobody was convicted. George Floyd's family was settled before the trial even started. Question marks in my head. Let's get that done. My friend Manuel Mata, a citizen of Fort Worth, Texas, arrested over 10 times for doing things that he was constitutionally allowed to do. 10 times. Well, at one time, he lost the case even though he should have won that case because he didn't do anything wrong. In five days, Manuel turns himself in for that incident. And it saddens me that he has to do that. And I know some will say, well, Mr. James, that's in the court system. You know, he was found guilty. Well, before it got to the court system, there was a police department that could have handled that situation. Fort Worth is a great city. $3.1 billion tells you that you have a great city. But be as great a city to everyone, not just your tourists. And as far as the city being a tale of two cities and glasses being half full or not full, it's a tale of three cities, and some of us don't even have a glass. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Please call the next speaker. Our next speaker is Akifa Khan. Hi, um, I'm Akifa from District 6. What does it feel like to have your heart break, to feel it drop and sink, to liberate it from yourself, to be firm with the Almighty deep in your soul. On Judgment Day, will Jesus on him be peace, save and intercede for you? Will you, who are in a position of power, stay silent while his birth land is being bombed, and during the mass displacement and starvation of thousands of people? 
Would he have been there as a healer to the wounded, on him be peace, and the sick of the Shifa hospital, on them be peace, be for those who have passed? What will happen on Judgment Day? Are Palestinian, are Palestinian lives worth less than Israeli lives? Are brown and black lives worth less to you than white lives? Are Palestinian Christians exempt from safety during Easter? Human life, regardless, regardless of ethnicity or creed, carries equal worth. No economic gain can justify the lives lost. Ensuring dignity and safety for all is non-negotiable. Silence is not an option. Please put it on, please put a ceasefire, permanent ceasefire resolution on the agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Please call the next speaker. Is Waleed Abdul Hamid in the chamber? Okay. Next speaker is Miriam Fatah. Good evening, everyone. My name is Miriam. I spoke to you in January about my husband's cousin who was wrongfully attacked in the West Bank, and he witnessed his friend get shot by an Israeli soldier. In January, over 23,000 Palestinians had been killed by Israel. 59,000 had been wounded. As of March 30th, 31,000 have been killed 72,000 wounded, 1.2 million are now homeless. I want to go over some news that I've been trying to wrap my head around over the past few months and some questions that I can't truly find an answer to. In January, thousands of Israelis attended a convention in Jerusalem to discuss illegal settlements in the West Bank and in Gaza. The National Security Minister of Israel was in attendance. This event did not just happen in Jerusalem, it also happened here in the US and in Canada. I've been wondering if this whole mess is about Hamas, then why are we discussing building illegal settlements in Gaza and the West Bank? Why are we discussing the displacement of thousands of Palestinians who have been there for thousands of years. If this is about Hamas, then why did they kill six world central kitchen workers this week? If this is about Hamas, then why did they block baby formula from entering Gaza? I didn't know that baby formula was used to make weapons. If it is, please let me know after the meeting because I've been a wreck these past few months. So if any one of you have answers to my questions, please let me know. I've heard people say that this issue is so complicated. They don't want to speak about it. They don't want to educate themselves, ask questions, take a stance. It's so complicated. And it is. It is complicated when you believe that violent occupation is morally sound. It is complicated if you believe that the extermination of an entire people is morally sound. It is complicated if you believe, like Israelis believe, that Palestinians are, and I quote, human animals and beasts. I certainly do not believe this. And if you believe this, then I'm not sure that I want any of you to represent me. Thank you. Thank you. Please call the next speaker. Our next speaker is Arsalan Jeffrey. All right, so as a recap of our last session, um, by not making a statement about a permanent ceasefire, 
uh, we have normalized and made tolerable the following genocide uh, because, you know, war is terrible. There's nothing you can do about it. Uh, domicide, because if the survivors have a home to go back to, you know, if they don't have a home to go back to, they, they don't have to be there. Uh, collective punishment, because they are all human animals, and that's the way they'll have to learn. Member aside, because if we destroy all of their educational, religious, and cultural sites, then they never existed. So hey, there's no genocide that occurred. Uh, dehumanization. Council members cannot even talk to us about a symbolic ceasefire resolution because it will upset their own willful ignorance. It is now day 178 of the live streaming of the genocide, so let's talk about the consequences of our inactions thus far. Weaponized starvation is an actual term. Uh, I warned you all ahead of time, hey, flower massacre was uh, an issue. Now there are multiple flower, massacre, flower massacres, uh, over 500 dead, minimum. People are now dying from humanitarian aid drops. Uh, they're either crushed or they are drowned, at least 30 that we know of so far. Uh, we now have the uh, World Central Kitchen aid workers that were assassinated. For what? So that way we can, have, we can ensure catastrophic famine continues. Aid organizations are now refusing to deliver aid all right, let's talk about the Al Shifa massacre. We allowed them to bomb the hospital. We allowed them to raid the hospital. And then we, by the way, when they raided the hospitals, you saw the decomposing babies in the incubators, okay? Now we've allowed them to completely destroy the hospital. We have reports of uh, mothers being raped in front of their families, children's being executed on the street, and medical workers are now being handed regular clothes because if they go out in their scrubs, they are targeted and assassinated. Okay, death toll for that is close to a thousand. Uh, disregard for American lives, another American citizen has been killed. And now, uh, because of the fragrant uh, violation of international treaties, uh, our friends are asking us now to be involved in further wars. Um, friends don't let friends drink and drive. Make a statement. Thank you. Our next speaker is Asaya Jeffrey. Council members, I stand before you with a question, and my question to you is this. What do you lose by sponsoring a ceasefire resolution? What are you afraid will happen if you pass it? Because clearly you are afraid of something if I'm still here asking for it after these many months. I mean, I can tell you what you lose if you don't sponsor a ceasefire resolution. You lose our respect and our votes. I know I talk a big game for a kid who can't even vote yet, but let's make this clear. My generation will not forget. If in one or two terms you're still somehow in politics, my generation will not forget of these times, we will not be distracted by ploys and campaigns that display you as men and women of the people. No, me and my uh, people will remember you as the people who ignored a child as she stepped and pleaded on behalf of a thousand other, of other children. I've said this before and I'll say it again. It is not too late to adopt and pass a ceasefire resolution. You can be the first in DFW to pass a ceasefire resolution, but know that, if, that the door is closing. And if you don't, by the time it does, we will never forget and you will forever be on the wrong side of history. Thank you. Thank you, and that being the last speaker, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you for coming.